The New Orleans Tribune is joined by Orleans Parish Sheriff Marlon Gusman and Chief of Corrections Carmen Desserie to talk about some of the opportunities, challenges, and recent controversies surrounding the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Gusman, I'd like to start with you. Um, and with recent developments, let's talk about the uh, plan to move 600 inmates from the uh, Justice Center to facilities across the state. Some are suggesting that it indicates an inability to manage the jail. Talk to us about why this move is necessary. Well, not really, nothing really to do with management as much as it is to do with staffing. So staffing is a key issue. And when we moved into the Justice Center, uh, we moved out of some really uh, outdated, dilapidated buildings, uh, giving us the opportunity uh, to move in on a more gradual basis uh, with resources that we did not have before. So if you remember, when we first moved in, we didn't have the ability to move 600 out. Now that we do, now that we're getting a uh, clear directive that that's what we should do, we're accomplishing it. 600, I would tell you, is the uh, high side. It may be less. Okay. Um and you say that this is something you're doing for staffing issues. Talk, staffing. talk to me a little bit more about what the current jail population is. Um, if you can, about the population ratio to the number of corrections officers you have, and what would be ideal? Well, one of the things that we did, which was a tremendous uh, difference in supervision, is that we went basically from remote supervision, where the deputy is behind <clears throat> the uh, bars to where now the deputy is inside of the housing unit. Uh, having the deputy inside of the housing unit uh, puts more uh, of a burden on the deputy to be better trained, better skilled, and better able to manage that inmate population. Uh, it depends upon, when you talk about staffing ratios, it depends upon the level of custody. So in some instances, uh, with a lower level of custody, uh, better behaved inmates, uh, we're able to do uh, 50, 60 to 1. But on the other hand, with the higher level of custodies, and we're seeing more and more violent crime in this community, then you have to increase that, that ratio. And sometimes it's even 2, 3, or, or maybe more uh, to a, a housing unit. And I have had the opportunity to tour the jail on a couple of occasions, and you're exactly right. Those um, officers are right there in the middle of those pods, close to the inmates. So. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you're saying that. I don't mean to cut you off, but you know, one of the things that you see is that calm housing units. And so I wanted to clarify what I said about the, uh, the management. So it's not a question of violence. Uh, because our violence has gone way, way down. It's a question of better management and training. Okay. I'm glad you brought up violence. I do want to ask you, uh, I read a recent report where you say that there have been zero incidents of violence with substantial injury. You're not suggesting that there is no violence at the jail. Could you please, you know, talk to that point? Well, exactly right. Now, you know, what I am telling you is that we document every incident that comes to our attention. What I am also telling you, though, is that in terms of injuries, substantial injuries, we've seen a tremendous decrease in them. Actually, for the first two months of this year, we had no incidents with substantial injuries. And that's a big contrast from what we used to experience when we were in the other buildings. Because in the other buildings, uh, we weren't able to videotape. We weren't able to have the housing, uh, the deputy inside of the housing unit, and all of that made a difference on uh, everything from response time to documentation to being able to say who the perpetrator was. It's had a tremendous effect. There has been controversy and criticism surrounding your uh, plan to move the 600 inmates, controversy and criticism surrounding um, the Man your management of the jail, but you say you're doing the best you can. If that's the case, what do you think has been the root of some of this controversy, this criticism, this call for receivership? 
Well, I think the root of it is that funding, uh, staffing. Uh, someone was telling me uh, just this morning that McDonald's is hiring at 11 something an hour. Uh, we pay our court deputies $10 an hour. We pay our uh, deputies that start, that work in the housing units, right above $12 an hour. So, you know, when you're trying to make sure that you have the proper staffing, that you have the proper uh, management, uh, funding is critical. So, um, Chair Guzman, um, I guess my next question is simply, what do you need in terms of funding? And let me ask it this way. The city says it's giving you the $60 million. You say, no, not really. And you still need more. Could you clarify for uh, our readers and our listeners what the funding issues are for the jail and why you still aren't getting the money that you need to properly operate the justice center? Well, an interest, if the city really were giving us $60 million, uh, that would probably be, su that would be sufficient. Uh, the fact is that they're not. The fact is, is that they are uh, not providing those revenues. In one case, uh, they're shorting us about three or four, about three million because they're including uh, some revenues that we have to use to pay debt service. Uh, in other cases, uh, they are not providing that full amount because they're, they're, it's tied to a contract that went up, uh, a medical services contract. Now, we need to be properly funded. If we are properly funded, then we can provide the pay raises that are needed for the deputies so that we can retain. You know, last year, our attrition rate was 47%. And in layman terms, that means for every two people you hire, one leaves. It's, it's almost impossible to run a business like that. Uh, my hat is off. And, I, and I'm proud of the hardworking men and women that we have, uh, but we need to have help. Speaking of help, um, Chief Desedia, you came to the Sheriff's Office May of last year, I believe. Correct. Okay, and you left February of this year. Now you're back. Could you talk to me, if you uh, don't mind very candidly, why you left in February, why you're back, and then if both of you could just kind of share your plans for progress and moving the office forward uh, with Chief Desetti here back as the Chief of Corrections? Well, there were some administration challenges um, that needed to be overcome, and quite frankly, it was making my forward progress a little difficult. And I did not think that I was able to do the job that the sheriff originally brought me here to do. And so with those hindrances in place and me not believing that I could give him my full potential and effort in getting compliance toward this consent of ju uh, judgment. I felt it was probably in both of our best interests that I step back until maybe those challenges could either be corrected or maybe the sheriff might choose to go into a different direction. Uh, since my leaving in February, the sheriff and I have kept in constant communication about what's been going on in the agency. and. Uh, He's come to me with corrective measures on some of those challenges that I, I face, and I, and I appreciate him offering an opportunity for me to come back and hopefully continue the work that we started uh, last year. Look, Chief DeSantier uh, is a 30-year veteran of the Cook County Department of Corrections. Uh, she's eminently qualified. She's experienced in direct supervision. She's actually guided the Cook County through uh, a consent judgment. So I have the utmost confidence in her. Uh, I think uh, whenever you're dealing in management, you're dealing at the highest level, uh, you're gonna have challenges. Uh, but I'm delighted she's back and, and I think uh, her experience is what's going to make the difference in us getting to the consent judgment compliance quicker. As it relates to the consent judgment compliance, there is still criticism that your office is moving too slow. But you say there's progress. Could you speak specifically to the areas of progress in terms of the consent decree? Well, I can tell you that, you know, our grievance system uh, made tremendous progress. Uh, I can tell you that in just about all areas, 
sanitation and cleanliness, tremendous progress. Uh, look, some of these consent judgments uh, take 10 years, 12 years, longer to accomplish. We've been in the consent judgment now for about two and a half years. And the progress we've made, we went from 5% when we started to now we're at 61%. Uh, so we're moving along. Uh, our medical uh, contract, uh, getting more and more to compliance. So we're seeing a lot of progress. Speaking of progress in general, you've now been sheriff for uh, since 2004, correct? Correct. So over 10 years. Your progress as sheriff, what are some of the things, when you talk about your administration, what you've been able to accomplish, what are some of the things that you point out? Well, I'll start off by telling you that I inherited, uh, or when I was elected, uh, we had 13 buildings, uh, almost a 6,000 daily population of inmates. Uh, Katrina came, and every single building that I had when I got elected has been either closed or demolished. Uh, we now are in a modern uh, facility, a uh, facility that has over 957 cameras, uh, a facility that's safer, a facility that's cleaner, a facility that's designed to take this community into the 21st century of corrections. Uh, direct supervision, although only practiced by a couple of uh, facilities here in Louisiana, uh, is what we should be doing. It's what other people have been doing for uh, 20 years. Uh, we had buildings, uh, old parish prison that everybody's familiar with, OPP, uh, that was designed and built almost 100 years ago. And you can imagine what they were thinking about in terms of corrections and incarceration 100 years ago. It's a lot different than what was happening right now. So, you know, what have I done over the last 10, 11 years? I've guided this department, this office, through some really tough times. And now, now we're poised to really be an example for the nation. The, the capacity at the sheriff's, uh, at the Justice Center is 1,438 beds, correct? That's correct. The total number of inmates that are there, including those that are out of custody, those that are still under the Arlington Parish inmates, even if they're out of custody, what's that number? So we currently have uh, right under 1,600, 1,578 uh, inmates that are in our care, custody, and control. The uh, Orleans Justice Center, uh, although it has 1,438 beds, it has a functional capacity of people, of inmates, of right under 1,150, 1,175. Once you start to exceed that, then you're, you're getting into areas where classification uh, just doesn't let you do it. It doesn't, it doesn't let you, for example, put high-level offenders with low-level offenders or predators with victims, uh, male with female, uh, people that have to be on protective custody uh, because they may be uh, testifying against someone or because of the nature of the crime that they've done. Uh, so there are a number of different, you know, uh, pregnant uh, people, uh, people that have mental uh, uh, challenges. So you, you want to make sure you keep all of those uh, separate, which is why you can't fill every bed. And when you say you talk about function, I want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly. Are you saying that it functions best at that level of about... About 1170, 1150. And the reason I ask that question, uh, Sheriff Guzman, is, and I've heard you say this many times, but I want you to repeat it. Who is responsible, or who determines, or what determines the jail population? Well, look, the city police department, the district attorney, and the judges. Uh, the city police department arrests, for the most part, uh, the district attorney charges, and the uh, judges decide who stays in. So we're really at the sheriff's office. We're not the determining factor. We don't decide who stays in. We don't decide who gets out. 
Uh, we don't decide who comes in in the first place. So uh, if they want to make the jail smaller, it's really simple. Stop arresting people, stop keeping them in, and let them out. But I think this community uh, clearly has a violent crime problem uh, that it's trying to address. Um, talk to me a little bit about, in a couple of weeks, a few days, I'm assuming, um, you have some very important dates as it relates to this receivership suit. Um, you are committed to vehemently defending your office against this. Talk to me a little bit about your yes. plan your right. We have uh, a fine legal team, uh, and they're going to uh, present their opposition. Uh, look. When we were operating uh, Old Parish Prison in Conchetta, uh, nobody was talking about receivership. Now that we're in this modern building and haven't been in the building for even a year yet, uh, right about seven, eight months, uh, now they want to start about talking about taking over. Uh, look, they don't need to take over. We have this. Uh, we're going to continue to work hard. Uh, we need to get the funding. If funding's the issue, and that's the issue we think it is, then we ought to be properly funded. Uh, but we're going to vehemently fight it. We're going to fight it, we're going to oppose it, and we're going to be successful. I always like to ask, is there anything I haven't asked about your job, your work, these challenges that you want our readers to know? Well, I think the readers should know that the Chief Desadier comes here uh, with a tremendous background. Uh, she was a number two person uh, at the Cook County Department of Corrections, and Chief can probably tell you more about the different uh, populations they dealt with, the size of the jail, uh, so that people can get an appreciation for uh, what those challenges are. And they're not much different than the challenges that we face here. Chief. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, from your experiences, particularly at Cook County and now that you're here, are you seeing anything at the Orleans Justice Center that is insurmountable, or do you see challenges and opportunities that can bring uh, our prison, um, our local jail, to the place that it needs to be? Well, actually, contrary to myth, there's nothing going on in New Orleans that isn't going on all over the world in correctional facilities. These are very common problems that are common to all correctional facilities. There are challenges you have to overcome, some more so than, than others. Um, when I was at Cook County as the first assistant executive director, we also were under a consent judgment. That isn't that much different from the one we're looking at here in New Orleans. The only difference is we were doing it on a larger scale. There, there was 10,000 inmates that we had to deal with over 11 different buildings. Here we're looking at one building now that we moved into the, uh, our new facility, but some of the challenges are the same. Um, our staffing levels are low, that creates problems, thus we have to send out inmates so that our staff can adequately secure the building and keep the inmates safe. That's nothing new in corrections. Uh, we, programming is necessary. Uh, there are some challenges here in New Orleans because we don't have a lot of community involvement in our programming. And that's also very important. We have to integrate them back into society when they get out. So we need community support. So if any of your readers or listeners are out there, we welcome anything that they can offer us so that we can have something constructive for the inmates to do while they're incarcerated in jail. And that is going to keep down a lot of the violence and friction that's going on. We need to keep them occupied. So no, this is nothing new that's going on in Oregon. It's just a challenge that we have to overcome. And we're going to be successful in doing that. But it should be noted that we need a lot of community help and support. And we welcome it. Now, any specific ways you see the community? I mean, you talked about jobs or any other ways you see the community? Perhaps well, I mean, uh, the basis behind a direct supervision jail is that you have to keep the inmates occupied with something to do. So community groups uh, that can offer parenting classes for our females, um, um, education on uh, pregnancy and the importance of keeping up your health and hygiene, things of that nature. Our youth are, are a big problem. Uh, things to keep them occupied, mentors to come in and, and speak to the young men, um, 
someone that they can listen to and say, hey, I, I'm just like you. I came from the same community you came out of, but I'm not here. Look what happened to me. That's the type of community involvement we need. Uh, from the religious sector, uh, we have all types of uh, denominations locked up there. So they need some support from their community church. Absolutely. I have one other question, Sheriff Guzman. Um, if you could speak a little bit about the, the political climate of some of these challenges and um, the criticism. There are elective sheriffs all over this country, um, and you're one. Uh, the consent decree, the, one of the last reports I read, spoke briefly but specifically about the political climate and how it is somehow possibly an, uh, something that is preventing some of the things that need to happen. Can this be overcome? I, I sure hope it can be overcome. You know, the, the primary focus uh, of any elected official ought to be public safety. And uh, our leadership needs to make public safety a top priority. And making t public safety a top priority means that you're engaging all of the members of the criminal justice system, uh, and not just one or two. So you can't have a strong police department who's also in a consent decree uh, without having a strong sheriff's office, without having a strong district attorney's office, without having a strong judicial branch, and without having a strong public defender's office. And when you're seeking to um, not fund properly one part of that, then it all starts to crumble. So, you know, I really hope that, that we can get around this, that our city council and mayor uh, will see that uh, this is important to do, that, that getting out of a com consent getting into compliance is, is as important for the sheriff as it is for the mayor and the city council. I want to thank both of you for joining us today and I wish you the best as you move forward with improving your segment of criminal justice in New Orleans. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Anitra. You.